Hi, I'm Sharon Davis, Chief Executive of Young Enterprise, and welcome to Series 3 of Enterprising Mindset, Minding Your Money. We'll be exploring the often overlooked role mindset plays in building financial capability and the significant benefits to be gained from understanding the impact our attitudes, beliefs and values have on our behaviours around money. I'm hoping we'll discover new ways to help young people build a money-related mindset and also explore the contribution this could have in increasing social mobility in the future. My guest today is Polly McKenzie, Chief Executive of Demos, a leading cross-party think tank specialising in public policy making in a range of areas from education and skills to health and housing. Polly actually started her career as a business journalist and in 2004 became a policy advisor on housing and local government for Ed Davey MP. She then worked for Nick Clegg from 2006 to 2015, helping to write the 2010 Coalition Agreement and serving as Director of Policy to the Deputy Prime Minister from 2010 to 2015. After leaving government, Polly established the operations of the Women's Equality Party and then went on to found the Money and Mental Health Policy Institute, a charity working to break the link between financial difficulty and mental health problems. Wow, that's an amazing resume, Polly. Welcome to Minding Your Money. Thanks so much for having me, Sharon. Brilliant. Well, I'm really interested to discuss your insights uh, because you've just uh, released a recent report in partnership with Yorkshire Building Society. But before we do that, um, I'd love to just get to know you a little bit better. I'd love for listeners to get to know you a little bit better. So my first question is, who and what were your early memorable influences that informed your attitude and mindset around money? It's such a great question. And, you know, reflecting on it, two different kind of images come to mind. The first is of my dad, who was endlessly balancing his checkbook and making calculations about mysterious things on the back of envelopes. Uh, You know, if a bill arrived, that was the main purpose for the bill was so that the envelope could have money calculations scribbled on the back of it, I think. And I am I was the youngest of my at least original brothers and sisters. I've got half sisters and steps as well. But and I remember being really envious of my brother because there's a sort of maths challenge, I guess. My dad would always get my brother to do the sums for him. And he was older than me and I couldn't do the sums. But there's a sort of mystical fascination with this idea of trying to make the numbers add up and then the idea that that sort of being diligent and, I don't know, calculating interest payments or whatever was was fun and something one might aspire to. Um, my parents got divorced and my um, my mum had, I think, you know, ended up working as an upholsterer having been a surgeon. I mean, that's a whole other different, uh, a different podcast, I think. But she was there, she wasn't the greatest of business uh, entrepreneurs um, and she wouldn't mind me saying that. So we, she never had really any money. And what I would do with my stepfather is we would go to the supermarket and we would always shop for the, we called them reductibles, the reduced items. And I I still absolutely love bargains, uh, partly because of that. You know, I like I do huge amounts of my shopping in charity shops. Uh, I love I love TK Maxx because of, you know, the bargain illusion it creates. I still, I, I bought some sausages, two packs of sausages for 75p in the co-op just this week. And I honestly, I can't tell you how much glee I get from that. And it's totally from the, you know, those shopping experiences from my stepdad, which was a sort of, again, a, something that was actively enjoyable, not a burden to hunt for bargains. And those those early influences do really imprint on us, don't they, in our adult relationships with money. You've talked about the reductibles. You've talked about being able to kind of shop and feel great, that buzz of of getting a bargain. Is there any other kind of early influences that really have stuck with you, with your early, your, your emotional relationship with money as an adult? I think in general, feeling that you, you know, you have to work hard for money. My, you know, my mum worked extremely hard and it it never seemed to do very much. And I, you know, I'm, I'm much more comfortably off than she was. Uh, and I, I, it took me a really long time to not actually be obsessive about budgeting and about making sure to shop around. I, you know, I went through a phase that I would, I would change my energy company every four or five months, as soon as I was sort of outside of the, can I get another discount? And, and the amount of, hours I would put into those sorts of things. And in the end, I just, 
I, I, I sort of I sort of let that stuff go because it was a kind of time tax on me that I, I you know I was lucky enough to to not have to pay. But it took a really really long time, long after I could afford not to worry about that ten pound bonus. I I carried on doing so. So that mindset stayed with you. It absolutely did. And for anybody listening who doesn't know who Demos is or what actually what a think tank is, um, give us a 90 second description of, of who Demos is and, and what you do. So it, Demos is a, a public policy institute. We come up with better ways to run the country or how to change the, the policy environment on any number of issues from how to run health service, how to run the financial services industry, um, how to improve waste collections. What we do is we're non-partisan, so we don't like we're not aligned to one particular party or particular mindset. What we do is we try and involve the public. Uh, my belief is that the lived experience of citizens is absolutely the most important thing to include when you're designing policy. Too many people have a sort of technocratic mindset. They think you can just design things and systems on spreadsheets. When you involve people, when you talk to them, you realise that lives are so much more complicated than that. So that's that's what we do. You know, being us a policy problem, we'll talk to a lot of people about what it really means for them in their lives. And then we will come up with recommendations for government, for businesses about how to make lives better. And and so you've got a recent report. It's called Bouncing Back, Boosting Young People's Financial Wellbeing Report. It's in partnership with Yorkshire Building Society. So what's the background to it and what, what does it aim to do? So, I mean, Yorkshire Building Society have been doing some interesting work around boosting savings and, and resilience. So we were talking to them about that. And it really struck us that people are talking about this, the COVID generation, young people who've had their financial situation and also their prospects so radically shifted by the pandemic. You know, it goes without saying, right, that the health impacts of the pandemic were absolutely concentrated among older people. Those were the ones who have... Um, who have suffered the most on that side, but on the economic side, it's it's young people, and and what what we and Yorkshire Building Society were sort of interested in is the question of that knock in such an early part of people's lives. How is that affecting people's aspirations? Uh, is it going to affect their savings? Is it going to affect whether they believe they can ever buy a home? And how is it affecting how they're actually spending their money now? And uh, and we wanted to explore that in detail with those young people who've lived through that to try and then, um, you know, work out like, how can we make things better? How can we improve the incentives for young people and also support that mindset about the importance of saving? It, certainly when I was younger, I sort of had probably from like my early, very early 20s, a sort of sense that I was saving to buy a house, even though I knew I, well, flat, but even though I knew I wouldn't be able to do it for years and years. And I think the more people are, uh, you know, feel that home ownership is completely out of their reach, the less incentive there is to kind of bother. It's a bit like when I left university, I was in quite a lot of debt. And I remember buying a laptop because I was like, well, what does another £600 difference make? And there is that sort of sense that when when the big things are out of reach or when you're in so much financial trouble that nothing really makes a difference, um, I think that does change the you know, because it's hard work, the the discipline of saving or the discipline of abstaining. Um, and you have to you have to believe in something for it to be worthwhile. And success, financial success and feeling comfortable with money uh, and how it enables you in life will mean different things to different people, won't it? It's always been fascinating to me that when you look at the the data in detail, the more debt you have, right, the more likely you are to have a mental health problem the more likely you are to find your debts overwhelming. But actually, that doesn't mean that everybody who's in debt is miserable and everyone who's not in debt is totally relaxed and happy. Actually, it's much more complicated than that. There are some people for whom, even though they're, even though they're actually doing fine, the, the mindset, they, they carry with them a huge amount of anxiety. There's also some people who end up being so abstemious that they cause themselves a kind of different kind of harm. Living, living absolutely on on the bare minimum because because of their anxieties and those people don't exhibit in kind of debt crisis, but their mental health, their anxiety may be driving their financial behaviours anyway and causing them a, di a different kind of harm. Uh, and and you know it, it's it's really difficult actually managing money. It's, it's it's not just the maths. 
It's how you feel about what you've got and what you haven't got that shapes people's experience of of their financial position, I think, so profoundly. And experience and mindset are so closely linked, aren't they? And introducing that long-term savings and investment culture we know is really important. And But as you've said, pensions, long-term investments, saving for a house, really tricky topic to cover, especially for young people right now. How, how do you think we can drive that positive savings behaviour in a way that feels relevant and accessible for young people? Try and talk to an 18-year-old about their pension and they're really going to like probably roll uh, their eyes at you. But on the other hand, we've got now certain kinds of investment, day trading platforms, for example, that do almost the opposite. They talk about investment as the land of immediate returns. And it's it's almost like gambling. And, you know, some gambling addiction charities are are reporting that they're hearing people approaching them who've, who've not come into gambling through sports or horse racing or anything, but absolutely through the idea of, of, of day trading and investment. And so you need, I think, to tell a, a different story that's about long-termism and building for the future, but that's on a better time horizon, that kind of like where you can be in five to 10 years that feels manageable to young people. But if it's either about today, um, tomorrow, or 50 years from now, it's it's much harder to sort of crystallise it, I think. I suppose chartered trust funds as well provide that opportunity, don't they? You've got a there is an investment there for many eighteen year olds now. Yeah, I think it's it's such a sort of salient moment, isn't it? Coming in coming into your funds, and you know culturally we we think of that as being more to do with I don't know trustafarians, people who are going to suddenly inherit lots of money and then their parents freak out because they. You know, they can access their trust fund. It happens in, I don't know, American TV shows. But the child trust funds are it, much smaller amounts and yet significant to people. I um, I, I inherited um, £500 from my uh, my uncle who died very sadly when I was when I was just three. And it had then been, um, I mean, put in a bank account. It didn't, it didn't make much money, but I remember it, it got up to, I don't know, £600 or something radical like that, which I, I was then able to to spend on a, a work experience trip during my A-levels uh, to the United States. And it was amazing how, you know, a, a relatively small amount of money really unlocked a, a life-changing opportunity for me and, and no doubt for so many people. There is a question of who do you turn to for advice about how to spend that? At Demos, we've done quite a lot of work on this concept of uh, network poverty, question of who do you know? We think of that around employment in particular, you know, like jobs for the boys, how work experience networks work. And if you only know people who are in kind of blue collar jobs, it's harder to get work experience and then aspire to a more highly paid profession. And there's certain but, codes of behaviour that you don't know about unless you know about yeah, absolutely. That networks. But yeah. I think it's the case for all sorts of things, actually. Mm. You know, we started off talking about my dad and his like all his doing his maths um, on the backs of those envelopes. But it's a it's a cultural thing. And so, you know, when I was wondering about credit card bills, I absolutely knew who to ask. But lots of people don't necessarily have uh, access to that information, advice, and guidance, and you can make up some of it through schools, some of it through peer networks. But it's a reminder that you know our our life chances are so shaped by by who we know and who is in our family. Let, well, let's not be depressed about that because it means that you can pay forward insight through generations. Actually, if you teach kids, they can often teach their parents new things and teach parents, and they will change the lives of their kids too. So it means that you can, um, if you change a mindset, you can actually have really profound ripple effects. Mm. And in your report, you actually talk about, don't you, it being really important young people know what to do if their friends turn to them for help, what's appropriate or inappropriate advice, and who they can signpost their friends to. So how important are relatable role models when it comes to developing financial capability among young people? I think absolutely important but it's true across so many of the different policy areas that I have ever looked at and again it's networks are what make our lives full really I think so often policymakers think exclusively about how do I solve this with a new state intervention or a new bit of the government or some new professionals to get involved and those professionals then roll their eyes because who do we actually go to for help it's the people we know it's the people around us 
there have been some really interesting pilots of um, more in, in deprived communities, more, more among kind of the adult population of things like money mentors, where you train up somebody who's in the community of the community on the housing estate to be someone that friends and neighbours can turn to, to get a bit of help and advice. Because good advice goes viral sometimes, but bad advice can also go viral in really, really unhealthy ways. So like a but, financial champion who is at the youth who's in the youth club or the community centre. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But do you know that relatable thing is super, super important. In sociology it's called homophily, but also people like us itis, I've heard it described as, is do you know what we just we just like people who are like us. And we can decry that and say that in a liberal society we need to also hang out with people who are of different generations, of different genders, of different races, different ethnicities. Uh, different income levels, and we should. But the reality is that if you want a quick win, people prefer to hear stuff from, and they're much more likely to listen to people like them because of our inherent homophily. I love that word. I've never heard that word before in my life. You've taught me something new. Thank you. I only learned it about two months ago. So like, you know. (laughs) Homophily. Is it right? Okay. Homophily, like H-O-M-O and then Philly, P-H-I-L-Y, like, um, I I love that. like from the Greek lover. I am going to introduce that that word into dinner with my wife tonight and she will raise her eyebrows and be very (laughs) impressed. Thank you very much for that. Sounds fabulous. So you talked about building financially, you know, kind of, uh, you know, networks within communities. How how do you feel we can improve that ecosystem for young people's access to like credible financial education inside and outside of formal education? Because it's not just the role of formal education. How do you think we can do that? Does the report talk about that at all? No, I mean, it's not something we look at much here, but I think it's a sort of fundamental uh, way we need to reconfigure how public services relate to people is we tend to think of them as sort of purely transactional. There is a citizen who needs something done to them. They need some financial information, for example. And how can I find a professional to to do it to them, to educate them, to give them a leaflet, whatever it might be? Uh, A sort of transactional model. And um, in fact, I think often what public services can do is bring communities together to resolve problems themselves with the support of the expert to the group as a whole. And and actually, when it comes to a school, for example, it, are you just trying to like insert some stuff, some knowledge into the brains of the kids? Or are you trying to turn them into fully rounded citizens? And what is the role of that school in the community? You know, there are some schools that take a really active role in bringing parents in in connecting parents to one another so that they can start to establish those learning networks, childcare networks, advice networks, where we just look after each other. And there are other schools who get a bit frightened of GDPR and feel that they, as an institution, have to only have relationships with individual parents or individual families. And I think that that's a much worse model. You need to take an asset-based approach to it. You know, who do you know in the school? Like, who are the kids who know more about this stuff, who can help each other? And how do you make sure that they're available and networked to and sharing information? Who are the parents who you can bring in? What are the assets you have in your teaching staff, in your, you know, your your ground staff, whoever they are? And, and just build up the number and the scope of the conversations that are happening. It's so much more complicated. And, you know, I have every sympathy for head teachers in particular, and all teachers who are sort of driven by the performance regime around schools to just focus on putting knowledge into children's brains. But if you're not if you're not building a community of your school, I think you're you're missing out enormously because it is the social capital, the relationships between people in that community, which offers uh, resilience. Um, builds up the collective assets of knowledge and actually gives people a much safer grounding from which to go on in life. And it's that collaboration, isn't it, across sector between informal and formal education because the youth youth settings and youth workers provide amazing educational opportunities and it is about kind of building that asset approach of the community and not expecting one stakeholder to do the heavy lifting. Completely agree. You know, it's 
I was uh, talking to Matt Hyde, the chief exec of the Scouts, actually, just uh, last week. And, he, you know, he was talking about the financial education badges that they now have within Scouts and guiding. And, and you know, it's great. That's for some people, that's a really a much better place to learn and get involved in those things. It, for some people, it's actually talking to a mate at a youth club or informal resources. And some uh, but but then, of course, schools can also be involved in helping those other organisations to thrive. You know, when I was at school, our Brownies Club met in the school. It wasn't of the school, but the school l- let them have the space. And, you know, again, it's all about, like, looking at the assets you have as a community, as a group of organisations, and how do you how do you leverage that in order to maximise the benefits for everybody? And that asset-based approach, you've you've kind of moved that on in your thinking because you've explored uh, in the Bouncing Back report, uh, you explore employer-led financial education. So tell us a, a little bit more about the opportunities you see for employers to support more young people to develop financial resilience. Well, here's a key observation about employers, right? Like they know how much you earn. Um, <laughs> yeah. In fact, they're responsible for giving you your money. And I'm amazed by the amount of debt stigma that we still have in this country. It really sort of depresses me. Um, and again, it, it seems I once visited a really amazing, uh, I'll get back to employers in a moment, I promise, but a really amazing debt advice intervention based in um, a wing of King's College Hospital that was a ward dedicated to people who just had uh, life altering injuries and amputations. And they just recognised that this wasn't about like providing a leaflet and referring people. Every single patient who went through that ward who had had an amputation was going to go through a financial change, right? They just they just were. And so they just made it absolutely central part of the pathway for care. And I, it's that mindset of just noticing something that is happening to everybody who you're dealing with. Everybody who you take onto your staff is going through some sort of financial transition. It might be a really good one. It might be taking, they might be earning more or earning money for the first time. But that means that there's there's information that they need. There's advice that they might need. Somebody's getting a pay rise. There are opportunities there to talk to them about whether, whether they need all that money or actually some of it might be good to put in savings. And employers should care about that stuff because, you know, if you want to worry about the UK's productivity problem, so much really ropey evidence about what makes a difference. The best evidence is that what impairs productivity is financial stress. So if your team, if your members of staff are suffering from financial stress because they don't know how to manage their money, because they uh, their bills are not fall, falling in line with the correct cycle because uh, of, of their pay, because they didn't have money for a deposit for a flat, that will have an effect on how good they are at their job. And so it's in the employer's interests to get involved in that stuff. And it's not that awkward for an employer to have a conversation about money because the employer already knows about money. They know what's going into your bank account and they have so many tools, whether it is save as you earn schemes, uh, loan schemes that can let people, whatever, buy a bike, buy that, you know, put down that, that rental deposit. And also, Because once you've started that conversation, offer support, advice and guidance between people. I um, set up this charity, Money and Mental Health, with Martin Lewis of of Money Saving Expert. Other things exist, of course, that do the same thing. But they have on their website a sort of guideline for how, how to go through all of your budget and work out how to manage stuff. And I would give all of my staff, I would say, you know, in your first month, you've got a day to do all of that. You can do it. In one single day, you can do it, you know, a couple of hours, a few different days, but you're allowed to spend a day of your working time going through all of that and sorting yourself out because that is in my interests. You know, so you don't need to, as an employer, be the one coming up with creative financial advice ideas. There's loads out there. It's about giving people the time and having the confidence that doing that, helping people, especially young people, managing a budget for the first time, helping them will help you. My final question, this is, I've got so many questions I want to ask you, but this is my final question. We know there's very little out there in terms of research that links financial capability with social mobility. At Young Enterprise, we talked a lot about a really great opportunity 
to explore the potential contribution financial capability could make to social mobility. Can you just spend a few minutes just kind of sharing your thoughts from a policy potential perspective around that issue? We have this problem with all kind of financial education and financial capability interventions is that almost all of them get good evaluations from participants at the time. Uh, But there's very little longitudinal evidence to show that they make a difference over time. Um, But I think you'd have to be a bit mad to think that they therefore shouldn't happen or that they don't have value. Um, So I I, I think my first thought is that we shouldn't panic about the fact that, you know, robust clinical standards of evidence about these interventions doesn't exist. And, And we shouldn't sort of like, think oh well, therefore it's all a disaster um it's really complicated to disaggregate your capability uh character-based kind of asset skill set from precisely what happens to you because partly because people's financial lives are full of full of complexity but i think the reality is that if you can't manage your money because of a lack of skills or because of mental health problems, cognitive impairments, mindset issues, there's no question that 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 holds you back. Because the more you can build up a nest egg, the more you can take that kind of that approach to to building up your financial resilience, so that you can take risks. The more opportunities you have. I think what what's really clearly evidenced is the way that debt and mental health problems create a spiral because the more in the more in debt you are the more likely to have mental health problems and the more mental health problems you have the harder it is to manage your way out of debt so i think we can be confident that the reverse is true even if i can't get a journal article in the lancet to prove it the better you feel about money the easier it is to manage it the more confident you feel and therefore over time the more money you have because you know those those 10 pound savings from switching your energy supplier which comes from a confidence that you can manage the 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 administration of it i guess it adds up over time it really does make a difference polly thank you so much for sharing your insights today i've learned an incredible amount um i really appreciate you giving us your considered thoughts and being so generous with your time i'm certainly going to be using that word homophily later this evening (laughs) uh it's been an absolute pleasure talking with you today thank you so much thanks for having me to hear more interviews like this and access series one and two please do subscribe to enterprising mindsets on your favorite podcast service thank you thank you